Hey, I'm Decathlon Gamer, and welcome to this special series where we discuss the Tour de France and play games while we're at it. Casual gaming. Today's game is Transport Inc., and today's Tour de France discussion is centered around stage number nine of the Tour de France, which just wrapped up uh, about 20 minutes ago, real time, at least of recording this and then i will get this posted uh as soon as i'm done with it and able to get it posted so available for you just about right away today was another day for the climbers and uh it started like the last couple of stages in exciting fashion very surprised that we have managed to have three straight major major intense stages but yes we we have done it uh three intense stages in a row this one right from the off the excitement got underway there was too much pace there was no break able to be formed after seeing what happened yesterday possibly we had a scenario We had a scenario where everybody wanted to get into the break. They knew that the breakaway could win if allowed to go up the road. And so virtually every team wanted to get into the breakaway. As a result, nobody was allowing other teams to get away. So they chased and they chased and they chased and a stomach virus for Fabio Aru, who lost a ton of time yesterday, went right out the back early in the stage. He would abandon before getting to the top of the first major climb of the day. So Aru out of the race. That's one of the first big pieces of news that we had in this one. Then we have this situation where because of this chase, attack, chase, attack, chase, attack. The peloton averaged 48 kilometers per hour for the first hour. A very, very high rate of pace through a somewhat undulating terrain. That was, that was pretty crazy. And it did a lot of damage. Now at that point, Aru was the only one who had gone out the back and everybody else was still there. But then they reached the the lower slopes of the biggest climb of the day, essentially midpoint of of the stage, or not quite midpoint, or at least the peak would be around midpoint. That's the Col de la Arcer, 11.1 kilometers in length, 8.8% average gradient. set up a route from Hobart. It's hard to play a game at the same time and have these discussions when you have to think and do math in your head. <laughs> Alright, so we've got our first route underway and whoa, hello. Scrolling like super speed. I am playing on my Mac. Uh, again, for those who haven't heard, if you didn't see the last episode or haven't read the posts, uh, my CPU uh, that was less than three months old, took a very, very early, early death. And let's see, you had 55. Let's go ahead and take one that's 40. Put that on there. And what was the passenger rate? 35. You know what? Let's just go right to the max. We'll take 36. There you go. And there's our first route. Also, unpause this. Boy, that edge of screen scrolling is intense. So they reach the base of the Orsair. Uh, you finally get a chance where some of the stronger climbers that were interested in the break are able to get off the front. And within about 500 meters of those first riders getting 
successfully off the front, the peloton itself begins to crack because of that intense pace. A lot of riders had been on edge for those first 60 kilometers or so before they reached the climb. Initially, you had eight riders away, but then more riders kept trying to make the jump. They were still interested in the break. So then all of a sudden we had 11 riders, and then it was 15 or maybe even 20. Four kilometers up the climb, Jumbo Visma had taken over the peloton and were already chasing down the majority of the breakaway. By the time they were halfway up that climb, the, the Orsair, the 11-kilometer climb, so within about three kilometers of that point, we were suddenly down to Mark Hershey off the front with seven chasers behind him. And then Jumbo Visma leading the peloton up the climb. Pino had tried to join the break had been caught. He was in that group that was caught early on by Jumbo Visma. Al Philippe had tried, though much earlier in the stage, to get away. One of the ones who did manage to get away, among those guys who lost a bunch of time the day before, Martinez. Martinez was one of the seven chasers, with his fate now set to being a breakaway rider targeting stages. Let's see, Hobart, you have St. Mary's. Let's go ahead and open a route to here. That's 43, so we can get 36 on that route. All right, now the next thing is checking if we are actually filling up these vehicles. Like they are not quite full, so we're going to lower the price just a little bit by a couple dollars, and hopefully we'll start filling that one out. Okay, the other vehicles all full, so we're good to go on those. I'm also going to start playing a little bit faster, even though I'm not terribly active in what I'm doing on the game currently. But we'll sort through that. At the top of that climb, the Orsair, Hershey goes over the top first. It's Category 1, surprisingly, actually, that it was a Category 1, considering it was 11 kilometers and nearly 9% on the gradient. I figured that was going to lead to an all category, 20 points, but they made it a cat one. So big cat one on the verge. It's so only 10 points at the top. Hershey gets those. But he also was distancing the chasers. Uh, he had maybe a minute gap at the top of the Orsair, and then it was only a short descent because they almost immediately, through that being a saddle, turned around and headed back uphill again to the Col du Sol, uh, Sure. The Sure, 3.8 kilometers in length, so very short. It was just, like I said, uh, the inner part of a saddle at 7.4% average gradient. That was a Cat 3. Hershey would lead up to the top of that as well, collect two points. Now, Hershey's great strength as a rider, he's a good climber, but as a rider, his great strength is descending. And he really, really proved that today, even though he uh, nearly crashed out early in the stage, uh, trying to form a break. Those descents, the one off the Sude, even though it was a short climb, it was the long descent that the Orsair didn't get. Uh, between those two descents, though, he opened up a pretty significant gap being cat three sude that was two points so that was 12 points already on the day that he had picked up but that long descent also as i got up to that higher higher elevation even though it was a dry day overall at the top of those two climbs it was wet it was very cold and while everyone else rode cautiously particularly down the descents Hershey suddenly opened up a massive gap. Those seven chasers, three and a half minutes behind. The peloton, led by Jumbo Visma, led by Wout Van Aert, four and a half minutes behind. Once they reached the base, short, short gap over the valley before they got to the day's intermediate sprint point. 
And for that, Peter Sagan, hugely, hugely disappointing day for him. This was one of those earmarked days. Let's see, we're actually losing a little bit here as well. Let's turn that down some. And then let's work on opening another route. I think we had one to Bernie. Yes, we did. 39 regular passengers. So let's go ahead and grab a full bus for that one. All right, this one with 31, that's still not low enough. Let's bring that down to about 45 and we'll keep these running for a little bit as some of the other companies are gaining a little bit of ground on me, but uh, we're doing just fine with things as it is. Uh, Sagan really disappointing because this was one of those days where he figured he could get into the breakaway, survive over those climbs, or at least just about survive over those climbs, and then he, being arguably the best bike handler in the world, could probably handle the descent in a manner that he could catch back up with a breakaway group that was expected to have many minutes lead. Sagan had tried to get into the break multiple times, but then that break never formed until they were on the lower slopes of the Orsair, which ruled out non-climbers at that point. There was no way he was going to be able to generate enough power on that climb to stay in that breakaway and make it up the 11 kilometers. And then another climb right after with no real break in between. So Sagan completely misses out. Now, Hershey's at the front. He's got seven chasers. That's your front eight. None of those guys are involved in the sprint competition. But then following that is the race for ninth with a peloton that went pretty hard and left behind a huge chunk of the field. 40, 50 riders left, maybe 50. A single sprinter remained, Matteo Trentin who is very much a hybrid, like Sagan, but a little bit better climber than Sagan, and actually recently a little bit stronger of a sprinter as well, he claims ninth pretty easily. That's worth seven points. That moved him up to fifth place in the competition. He has 98 overall to Sagan's 138. So he's 40 points behind, not really in reach. Important thing happened next, though. Understated, but very important. Sagan's teammate, Grosschartner, competed. He wasn't going to beat Trentin, and he didn't. He was two or three bike lengths behind him. But Grosschartner overtakes the peloton, attacks the line, picks up 10th place. It's only one point. <laughs> it's only one point. But he knew the importance of what Sagan was doing. He took points away from the rider who led the peloton up the Orsair, up the Sude, through the sprint point outside of the two guys who sprinted off the front, Trentin and Groschartner, and that is Van Aert. Van Aert, not somebody who's been competing for the points classification. But boy, oh boy, you can see him in the likeness of Peter Sagan. Sagan is a hybrid rider. He's not the fastest sprinter. He's a very good sprinter. There is definitely better. And he knows that. And that's why he never goes full gas on the intermediates. He goes full gas for the finish line. He saves that energy for that. But he's that guy who periodically gets into breakaways, collects intermediate sprints where no other sprinter is able to ride and earns the big points that way. And that's where he has won the green jersey so many times. Van Aert, a guy with a really good turn of pace, who's actually won a sprint already here that you wouldn't think would have gone to a Sagan or a Van Aert, who are very good sprinters, but not among the sports elite. You know, they're not Bennett, they're not Ewan who have been the quickest sprinters at this tour so far. 
And yet Van Art can really climb and has great stamina. He's a fantastic classics writer like Sagan. So comparisons, well, a lot of people talked early in Sagan's career that he could do so much more, as in he was capable of so much more than just being a sprinter. And we've seen that hybrid. We, we certainly have the classics writer, right? He's a sprinter and a classics writer. Van Aert, that's how he's being seen right now. But he looks like he's got arguably the potential to compete for Grand Tours or stage races in general. I mean, he just looks like he can be a world-class winner, right? Alaphilippe is a world-class winner. He's a puncher. He can sprint. He can do so many things. Van Art, clearly somebody similar. We got 38-38. Let's go ahead and open a route to Bernie from Queenstown. 38-38. So let's grab 36 here. This is Queenstown to Bernie. We'll also do the same. Uh, it's a little stretch going for 40, but let's do it. All right, that is very much not full, so we're going to lower the price quite a bit. Got to have a full truck to make some money. All right, also time to do something else that we should have done a while ago. We're going to take Queenstown and open a depot. So we can start bringing in uh, the vehicles to get them repaired, but I'm not going to do this manually because I am... Way too distracted. So we're going to hire a manager for 30000 And we're going to assign all vehicles to that task. You can already see we've got a couple that have dropped below that point now. Uh, we're also probably going to take this depot and run a couple upgrades. Let's take that maintenance level up so it repairs more quickly. I think we're fine with the capacity because there's just not that many vehicles here. Um, we're not going to be adding that many more uh, in the time to come. All right, so Van Art rolls behind Gross Schartner, 11th cross line, adding five points to his total. He's in third place, by the way, in the points classification. He has 111, it's 27 behind Sagan. But if he keeps going on like this, he could be the one where it's normally Sagan. He could be the one who keeps rolling through intermediate sprints, picking up points where Sagan does not. Especially if this tour continues on with this level of difficulty that it currently has. Watch out for Van Art. I think he can certainly challenge Sam Bennett at this point for second place in that points classification. And Sagan's going to have to keep working hard. This is not a foregone conclusion that he's going to win that green jersey at the Champs-Élysées. Next up, a little bit of valley before they then head up the uh, Col de Isher. By the time they hit the base... Hershey, remember Hershey? Yeah, it's been a while. Spent all day trying to get into the break and then got away up that first climb and then stretched that lead over the descent. By the time they hit the base of that climb, he was 4 minutes and 25 seconds ahead of the peloton. And just as the peloton reached the base of that climb, those seven chasers, which include Martinez and a number of strong climbers, they had fallen back enough where the peloton was just behind them, so they kind of sat up and joined the group at the base of the climb. Uh, Pino, who had been not only dropped from the break and caught by the peloton, had then been dropped by the peloton and had gone back about a minute and a half or so. Uh, over the descending, he was a little more aggressive compared to uh, the peloton and, and then on the flat. Also recovered just in time at the base of that climb to reach the peloton. As they went up 
the Col de Isher, Van Art, had now been on the front of the peloton for 60 kilometers. So it had been all Hershey at the front, and it had been all Van Art in the chase. Hershey, with a four and a half minute lead, no problem going over the top of the Col de Isher, which was four and a half kilometers in length, 6.1% on the average gradient, another Cat 3. He collects the two points at the top. Which, by the way, he had just a couple points in the classification entering this. He went away in, what was that, like stage two, I think it was, where he was on the break and took second place. Uh, had a, a heck of a ride on that one and just just missed out. Uh, and was that that was the Alaphilippe stage, if I if I'm not mistaken. But one big statement was made at the top of that climb. Again, those chasers had been caught, so we had just a single rider, that four and a half minutes away, or at least at the base. And it was Van Aert, just steady pacing up that climb, slowly pulling Hershey back. Just before they reached the top of the climb, sprinting off the front of the peloton, just a handful of meters ahead of Van Aert, making a statement that he is interested in the KOM. And just as I predicted uh, in the video you watched this morning for yesterday's stage, David Gaudu, Groupama FTJ, getting involved in the KOM classification, it may have been Pino, but not at this point. It was Gaudu. Gaudu sprints off the front, collecting the other point. And then, of course, immediately drops back into the peloton. Gap at the top, down to 408 from the 425. So Hershey really, really maintaining a nice, strong pace and did not lose much ground at all. But, of course, he was only being chased by a single rider and not a major climb really didn't shrink the size of the peloton much at all over that one from the peak of the col de Isher to the base of the next climb and final climb of the day the marie blanc was 11 kilometers the gap by the time they hit the base when hershey hit the base of the climb that gap had dropped from 408 down to 332. By the time the peloton reached the base of the Marie Blanc, still led by Wow Van Art, down to 308. So he really started clawing back some time. Over that entire stretch, from the point that they started the first big climb of the day till this point, Roughly 75 kilometers of chasing Hershey plus seven others part of that time. Van Aert had led all of that except for about two kilometers on the flat just before the base of that climb where a teammate took over for just a brief little respite for him. Van Aert, early part of the climb brings it down to 2 minutes and 50 seconds. Bookman falls off the back due to his pace. And at the same time that Bookman falls off the back is when Wout Van Aert finally, with roughly 75 kilometers at the front, finally peels off and leaves it to Bookman. Let's, uh, let's focus on what is next for us here. Uh, Queenstown is already selected. It looks like they don't have anything to St. Mary's. St. Mary's, nothing to Bernie. So that's it for that island. Uh, Tasmania. Let's move on. New Zealand is included in the Tasmania region in this game. And so let's move down to uh, Dunedin and see what you have. Nothing to Christchurch. Uh, but you do have 87 regular passengers and 29 first class passengers to Nelson and we've got plenty of money to uh, get this started so 87 and what was that 29 ish why oh, this scroll thing on the Mac not cool 
I'd like to take that down off the settings because I've already lost track of where the heck are we? It's crazy scroll speed. Here we go. Let's get back to the tour in just a second as I sort this out. So this was regular passengers and first class passengers. Okay. Ah, that's too many, isn't it? We got 12 so far. Ah, there's. Okay, that'll put us at 24 in the first class. That should take care of all of them. And then we have plenty of regular passengers still to go. So, throw on a bunch of vehicles here. All right. Uh, we are not happy on the first class passengers pricing. Let's bring that down a lot. This one as well. Regular passengers full, first class tickets way too expensive. And it looks like your regular tickets are a bit too expensive. Bring that down to 45. Wow, down to 70 and we're still nowhere near full. Bring that down to 65. Okay, that one's full, that's good. It's a better bus than the other one. All right, back to this. So, Bookman falls off. He's going to drop back. He's going to lose a good amount of time and essentially be out of contention now. Sepkus takes over at the front. And he finishes the job. Van Art really, really brought the size of the, the group down. But when Sepkus took over, they sped up at that point And just decimated what was left of the group. They were on edge because of Van Art. Uh, 75k at the front, you're only going to go so fast. But by time Coos was done within a, uh, two or three kilometers, we were down to a very select group at the front. He dropped Pino halfway up the climb. The gap was down to 2 minutes 20 seconds. And that's also where the the climb ramps up quite a bit. When it ramped up, gap was down to a minute 50. Still coos on the front at that point. Pajakar, as soon as coos pulls off, Pajakar senses the opportunity, makes the first attack. Yates is dropped. De Moulin, who never even spent a single moment at the front, is also dropped. Many riders fall away. Coos really did some damage on this one. He had a much better day than what he had yesterday. Roglic and Landa, along with Bernal, bring back Pajakar. Pajakar continues trying to attack up the climb. Again and again, he keeps trying to attack, but never can even get off the front this time as they immediately check him each time that this happens. At the top of the climb, this is another Category 1. The Col de Marie Blanc was 7.3 kilometers in length. It was 8.7% average gradient, so... Same intensity as the Orsair, except for that it was gradual at first and got really steep towards the end. So uh, it was 11, 12, 13 uh, percent in those final half, uh, final few kilometers of that one, and that really, really made a difference because the the groups were very, very small, very select by the time they reached the top. Hershey, he was still the first one over the top. So he collects another 10 points, 22 on the day. Roglic goes over second, sprinting to the top because there was bonus seconds available at the top. The, was it 8, 6, and 4? Or 8, 5, and 2? Or I don't know. I don't know what the bonus seconds are. Uh, exactly how many. I think it's 8, 6, and 4. Roglic had closed within 16 seconds of Mark Hershey. At the top of that final climb. 
Pajikar goes over third, so he also picked up some seconds. The group containing Guillaume Martin, Romain Bardet, uh, they were 35 seconds back at the top of the climb, and Yates, who had been dropped a little earlier, along with Demoulin and others, were a minute and seven behind at the top of the climb. Now this one, leading towards the finish, about 14k to go to that finish line, this was an aggressive descent. 7k descending, 7k to the finish. Hershey, fantastic descender, he opens it back up from 16 seconds to 28 seconds at the base of the climb with 7 kilometers to go. Martin's group was 43 seconds behind. Yates was a minute 31. They were not anywhere near as aggressive on the descent as the groups in front of them. As they approached the finish, the final seven kilometers, Hershey was ahead of four chasers, including Bernal, Roglic, Landa, and Pajakar, who were then just ahead of Martin, Port, Bardet in a group containing three other riders. And Hershey couldn't maintain over the flat. With just 1.6 kilometers left to go in the stage, leading for nearly 100 kilometers all by himself with a fantastic ride along the way, Mark Hershey was caught by those four chasers. Leading to a five-man sprint at the finish. Hershey... Last guy in the line. Roglic, first guy in the line. When they started looking at each other for who was going to go and when they were going to go and thinking about the stage, Roglic was the one who continued to think about the GC. No, Bernal was there too. Surprising he didn't want to contribute. But Roglic went to the front, kept up the pace so that the, the gap behind didn't close much more than about 5, 10 seconds. Uh, over the that final one and a half kilometers. Hershey went first from the back. He went at about 250 meters out. A little too far. It was a good turn of base. He had recovered just a little bit before they caught him. It was a good attack. But Pajikar, as Hershey went by, Pajikar just got on his wheel. Stayed in the slipstream came out in the closing 75 meters or so and was able to just overtake, actually almost half a bike length, uh, just overtake Hershey. Hershey then didn't lunge for the line. He sat up just a little bit, and Roglic, coming up the other side, did lunge, did push, and ends up taking second. So Pajkar takes the stage win ahead of Primoz Roglic. Hershey gave it his all. Oh, so close. He was second on stage two. He was third on stage number nine. The only other one contributing or trying in the sprint was Egon Bernal, who comes across just behind those guys in fourth place. Landa just rolled in uh, to fifth, never giving much of an acceleration at all, other than just enough to keep uh, from losing any time to those guys. Following them, Martin, Port, Bardet, Uran, in that group of six that lost 11 seconds. It was roughly one minute to Yates's group, which included Valverde and others, De Moulin. Bookman rolled in at four minutes behind. We were at 21 contenders left, 21 riders within three minutes after stage number eight. I haven't seen those full results as the stage just finished, but... I'd say we're down to from between 13 and 15 now as more riders lost a large amount of time. I don't think it was just Bookman uh, who lost some time on the stage. So big highlights. Aru out. Pajikar wins the stage. Hershey, what a beast. Roglic, bonus seconds at the top of the Top climb and at the finish, 12 seconds of bonus overall. Yates drops time, so he drops the jersey, and it's Primoz Roglic now in yellow. And with those 12 seconds of bonus time, 
He sits 21 seconds ahead of Bernal, who didn't pick up any bonus time today. Martin lost a little bit of time, slips just a little bit back, but he's still third place. Gained and lost a position, 28 seconds behind. Bardet rolled in with him, so he's 30 seconds behind. Quintana and Uran also with him, 32 seconds behind. Pajikar gaining time yet again, now 44 seconds behind, but only gaining uh, one second on, on Roglic, I think. Gaining on everybody else, though, with his bonuses. Yates, a minute two. Lopez, minute 15, and Landa rounds out the top 10 at a minute 42, where you're starting to now look at, mm, that's starting to get to be a sizable chunk of time for Mikel Landa uh, to, to pull back with nine riders ahead of him anyway. One, two, three, six, eight might crack. All nine, though? Mm, probably not. Ooh, hello, I have not... Uh... Open a facility here. Let's take care of that. There you go. Let's give it a couple upgrades. And let's get our manager on it. There we go. All right. Uh, that'll take care of that. Uh, I've gone from the lead to last place with uh, very little effort in the game here. Just mostly sitting, discussing the race. In the KOM, Cosnafroy picked up one point. There was one very, very brief, brief, short uh, hill, <laughs> barely a hill. Uh, at the start of the stage, Cosnafroy got one point. So 36 for him now. Peter still sits on 31. Zacharin, 25. Scoins, 24. Hershey, by my count, picked up 22 points on the day. Had two points. That brought his total to 24. Uh the graphics at the end showed that he had 26. Either way, he's within 10 to 12 points now of the lead and very well could be a competitor for that KOM. So Peters, Zachary, Scoins, Hershey, maybe Paulus, all in it. Gaudu showing intent that he wants to get in on it. He's only picked up a point or two today, uh, so he's got a long ways to go. You see how on a stage like this, not even any all category climbs, two cat ones and a cat three. Oh, oh, I missed one. There was another cat. There was two cat threes in there, right? There was two cat threes. Hey, he does have 26 points. Okay. With that, you know, all, all it takes is one climbing stage where you go out and and claim two or three climbs especially if you get 20 on those all category climbs those points add up real fast real fast you can pick up 30 40 points on a day and when Kuznafoy finishes half an hour behind today you can tell he is just not a pure climber he's not going to hang on to that jersey much longer I, I definitely could tell you that is is bound to uh, pass on to somebody else before long Winners of the day, the front five. Uh, Landa, yeah, for him, winner of the day is just not losing time. Uh, he's 10th place. Uh, he never looked as strong as the others, but he hung in there, and, and that's big. Hershey, oh, man, oh, so close, so close to being huge winner of the day. Still, he, he, he gets the combative prize, uh, gets all those KOM points. Has a heck of a run. Definitely got a lot of recognition. It was, it was great performance. Doesn't win, though. Uh, Roglic, obviously good for him. He gains 12 seconds. He gains the yellow jersey. But his lead is not big. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The expectation was Roglic to have the lead. The expectation was Roglic to only have maybe Bernal within about a minute and having everybody else distanced at this point. He hasn't done that. He has not distanced really anyone. Well, uh, the group of contenders is getting smaller, but it's not him pulling away. It's them dropping off. He looks good, but he's looked really good ever since they came back from COVID-19. How long can he keep it up? 
I have a feeling that his advantage over other writers is just about gone by now. What's going to happen in the last week? Is he going to drop off? If he drops off, he's done. He's not winning this tour. I think he can at least hang on for a podium. But I actually think Roglic is not looking like he's going to run off with this race. I think it's kind of going the other direction. Bernal, 21 seconds behind. This is an ideal scenario for Bernal. He is in second place overall. He is behind a Jumbo Visma rider, who are the strongest team this year. It's going to force them to now control the peloton, stage by stage by stage. Ineos can save their riders. And going into that, that final week, if they're still in this position, if they're still 21 seconds behind as they enter the final week, their riders are going to be a bit more fresh than the Jumbo Visma riders like Van Art. Right? Spending 75 kilometers on the front. At some point, it's going to take its toll. Coos had a really bad day yesterday. He recovered and he had a better day today. But if he has a bad day and Jamulon had a bad day, uh, if Van Art has a bad day, Roglic is going to be isolated. Ineos has the chance to pounce. Bernal who is getting stronger day by day, has a chance to pounce. So he's in a good place. Roglic has the lead. Can't say he's not in a good place, but you'd almost expect more from him at this point. Martin, of course, is in a fantastic place, setting in third place overall. Bardet in reach, 30 seconds. Two riders, two French riders with hope. That's big. It's not Pino. Sour look on Pino's face multiple times today says a lot. Quintana, Uran, doing pretty well at 32 seconds, but not looking like the strong riders. They're the guys hanging on. Quintana looked pretty good yesterday, actually, but for the most part, those two mostly just hanging on. That was Martin a year ago. That's not going to lead to a podium, but it could lead to a good GC finish. Pajakar. Looking very threatening. He's back within 44 seconds. I think he could absolutely compete for a podium. At this point, if I were to say today, my predictions, I'd say Bernal to win by a small margin over Roglic. I'd say Pajakar keeps a similar gap to what he has now and finishes third or maybe a little further back, a little over a minute. I'd say Martin and Bardet. Fourth and fifth. Yates now down to over a minute. I think he's still close enough that he'll actually compete GC, but the pressure is off his shoulders. So the time that he lost because he was asked to do the chasing, he's not going to be asked to chase anymore. He'll be able to do what Quintana and Uran are doing and sit on. Lopez, I'm actually surprised he's still within this time. He has looked really weak. And Landa had a good day. But he'll lose time again at, at some point. He's just not quite on it this tour. Losers of the day. Tom Dumoulin didn't even spend one meter on the front for Jumbo Visma. Every single Jumbo Visma rider was on the front of the peloton, including Roglic at one point or another, except Tom Dumoulin. Did zero work for the team and... Lost a little over a minute, but just not looking like the top climber that he's supposed to be. The other teammates working their butts off and still staying in reasonable time. He's worked for 600 meters in the last two stages and lost a few minutes. And he's supposed to be a potential winner. I don't think so. Bookman, losing four minutes, big loser of the day. But the biggest loser of the day, Fabio Aru. Uh, unfortunate for him, stomach bug has ruled him out of the race. That's going to do it for this review, though. Uh, we head into the rest day, and I'm going to put one episode together recapping the first six stages, albeit much, uh, first seven stages, albeit much shorter than 
the individual stage recaps, and that will fill the void for tomorrow. Again, I'm Decathlon Gamer, and thanks for tuning in. Be sure to hit that like button. If you want to join the conversation, please do so in the comments below. And let's carry on with this, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Be safe out there, and bye for now.